Welcome to Celebrating Act 2. Celebrating Act 2 is the user manual for the second half of your life. Hello and welcome back, everybody. Hey, we have Hi, Manny everybody. We have Manny Pacheco here, my partner John Coleman. And it's Manny, another great day. You. It's another great day on the internet. <laughs> it's another great day in celebrating Act Two. I love Thank it. You, Manny. True, it is true. That is true. Thank you, Manny. I, I like to think that uh, we we it's obvious this is spontaneous because we all talk over each other. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that's a product of Zoom, don't you, or Skype? <laughs> oh, it might, it might be, yeah. Yep. They, uh, but it's also because we're not scripted. And we weren't and, brought up very well. We weren't brought and, up polite. We would reach on the table for food, and we wouldn't say, excuse me. <laughs> that's, that's, what I, that's what I'm thinking here. Oh, okay. okay. But I was thinking we are not scripted. And couldn't everybody use a good screenwriter, Manny? Yes, they could. Mm. I think screenwriters, that they, screenwriters yeah. are among the most unheralded uh, of Hollywood stars. Uh, there's always exceptions, but and probably the most important. Without a good script, where, where are you? Yeah. Yes, I, exactly. I mean, unless exactly. you're doing, unless you're doing, you know, spontaneous kinds of uh, scenes. I mean, what's the point? <laughs> by, by the way, I know that we're going to uh, get into uh, some of your favorite screenwriters and why they're really great. But it seems that there's a whole cottage industry of people who do rewrites, even for accomplished screenwriters. Isn't that yeah, also? Well, that's, a good, that's a good point. Yeah. There are, they're screenwriters. Mm -hmm. They may be rewrites, but they're screenwriters. So yeah, they, all, they all belong to the, screen, uh, the, the, uh, the Writers Guild. Absolutely. Sure. So, Manny, yeah. who, is, who is your favorite, doctors. one of your favorite uh, screenwriters of all time and well, why? First, let me say that I've written an article about the uh, the great screenwriters and the evolution of the screenplay that has appeared in a couple of pub publications, the latest in the Palace Verdes Pulse, uh, I'm happy to say. And uh, my contention is, is during the studio era of, of filmmaking, not only were screenwriters essential, they were treated like royalty by the movie moguls, and where folks were picked from actually were acclaimed novelists were the early screenwriters. Think about this. Right. In the silent era, um, things were kind of done on the fly. Uh, there were there were writers, but, uh, but the authors were not being used unless your name was Jules Verne or, you know, uh, or, or any other silent, uh, other science fiction writers. But once talkies came along, writers became essential and the movie moguls were smart enough to reach out to some of the acclaimed writers of the day such as Ernest Hemingway yeah and John F. Scott Stein Fitzgerald F Scott Fitzgerald John yeah. Steinbeck these yeah. folks that were part of what we call the jazz age of the 1920s these were the folks that were considered royalty uh, they were known globally so it was very easy for these wonderful um, writers to be part of a team. And in fact, in the movie, The Bad and the Beautiful, it's chronicled with Dick Powell playing the fictional writer that's being sought out by Kirk Douglas. So um, there was others. Of course, uh, it became really important in the 1930s, especially at Warner Brothers, to write gritty social commentary. So uh, even though they were not picked as screenplay writers, a lot of adapted um, works from Upton Sinclair or Sinclair Lewis. These were folks that were also being used by, by individuals like Eugene O'Neill or, or Steinbeck. John Steinbeck was uh, actually, you know, very big on that whole idea of social commentary. So that's where it began. Okay. And th that's why I would say, you know, Ernest Hemingway is probably an early favorite of mine because of all of his great works adapted onto the screen. Well, so would you say that, it, um, uh, it would fare in many of the other conversations that we have, we try to say, well, about this genre, that genre. Actually, it's probably periods of time that there were uh, people who were the best at what they did for that period of time, for maybe a genre or for just that period of time, pre-code, all those kind of things. So, so uh, are there favorites, let's say, in the early times as opposed to uh, uh, today? You know, that is such a great question, Art. I can't even tell you how good that is because genres really made the writers. If you take the, uh, for example, uh, the gangster films that evolved into film noir, uh, a number of names stick out. 
Dashiell Hammett, who started with early gangster films and mystery movies like The Thin Man and then evolved into making one of the great all-time early film noirs in The Maltese Falcon. Of course, uh, Raymond Chandler created one of the most iconic detectives of all time, Philip Marlowe, who was played by none other than Humphrey Bogart, Dick Powell, Robert Mitchum, Robert Montgomery. They all played Raymond Chan uh, 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 Philip Marlowe at one time, which is, of course, Raymond Chandler's character. And then I can't forget one of the finest writers that even a, a nickname was est established for him, and that was Damon Runyon. And uh, mm. that's where you get to play the gangster that's polite in, in movies yes. like Lady for a Day and Pocket Full of Miracles. Yes. Of course, the, the most iconic Runyon-esque, which is Guys and Dolls. Right. So, yes, right. you're right. The gangster film and the film noirs really fared well because of fabulous writing by iconic mystery uh, uh, authors. Yeah, so... Yeah, also there was like uh, Tracy and uh, Hepburn, people would write for them, and it was a very fast-paced banter, okay? Yes. Uh, to me, reminiscent of uh, what happened on, the, on TV in the West Wing. It's just this fast-paced banter back and forth, and so was that a genre that had uh, particular writers who were good at that? Well, Garson Kanan and Ruth Gordon, they were the yes. best. Ruth Gordon, of course, it was so good that she became an actress in her own right, but boy, I'll tell you, they, they really developed the persona of Tracy and Hepburn. I mean, in, in, in movies like uh, Pat and Mike, and particularly in Adam's Rib. Very, very good writer. So that's another, yeah, that's another bullseye, Art. You're doing well today. <laughs> it's nice to see Art took his meds. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> Just shows you right there. Meds, and I, I, I got a, a full night's sleep three weeks ago. <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> Now, an another group of, uh, uh, of writers that uh, probably in were influenced by Steinbeck and O'Neill, of course, uh, came along, and, and there was a renaissance of the 1950s of fabulous writing. Tennessee Williams and Arthur Miller were standouts, and they uh, joined that, that class of great writers who actually worked in tandem with the actors who by that time were developing what we called the method which is, of course, uh, actors going into their parts and studying their parts for, for, for many, many, um, many, many months before they a a a uttered a word on screen. Uh, if, if they had to play somebody with a disability, they would visit hospitals and, and roll around in a wheelchair to see what it was like. That method acting was established through Stanislavski, and, uh, and, and writers started becoming uh, more prolific in, in developing the method approach to their, to their screen adaptations. And the benefactors were folks like uh, Marlon Brando and Joanne Woodward and Paul Newman and uh, directors like Ilya Kazan, another actor that comes to mind, Eli Wallach. These were great actors who followed the method form of acting and the writers were really, really good. Now, what, why I mention this and why this is so important is because these many of these writers started writing for a newfangled idea called television, and they became stars in their own right. Folks like yeah. Patty Chayefsky and particularly Rod Serling, one yeah. of the great writers of all time. And so um, they would write for the movies. Rod Serling wrote Requiem for a Heavyweight and, and a wonderful piece called Patterns. And then uh, ended up um, getting his own contract to develop a science fiction anthology program that became The Twilight Zone. Yeah. Uh, do, do you think writers are less appreciated today? I don't know. I, 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 I just cannot imagine without writers what you would have. Now, I will give you anecdotal ed evidence that the, uh, that the studios today might think that. And here's why. When the writers went on strike, uh, well, about a decade, decade and a half ago, guess what came of it? Uh, uh, studio executives became more creative, and the rise of reality programming came about. And now reality programming is really dominating television, and what that means is that the writers have become less important. But 
That said, there is a home for writers on places like Netflix and Amazon Prime and some of the uh, some of the cable movie outlets. So, you know, writers I still think are very important, but they have to compete now with uh, reality programming, which doesn't you know emphasize the writer all that much. Hey, by the way, if I'm still on my meds, I have another question. Yeah, uh, if I haven't worn <laughs> off yet, is um, it seems to me that um, uh, a, if a movie is exceptionally well written, uh, it's like having a great cinematographer or an editor. You actually don't pay attention to the fact that there was a script or that there was whatever magic went on behind the scenes. It's really the performance that stands up and involve you uh, and I as an audience. So that probably the best writers are those that you can only take a look at in hindsight because while you're watching uh, the movie or the TV program, it's it's an absolutely non-event because they didn't do things wrong. The pace was right. The uh, all the pieces were right. The director did the right direction of the same script, even though it could have been done four different ways. And the result is is you got the husband and wife at the movie theater, and the husband turns to the wife and says. Wow, can you believe the absolute brilliance that's coming out of that star's mouth? That star is so talented and so yes. good. They don't say, oh, wow, what great writing. <laughs> that's <laughs> you know, true. They, they think that they make it up. They yeah. think it's a star. But truth be told, you know, at least in the past, I think more recently, maybe not as much, but you would get these thanks. Thank you to my to God, to my family, and to the writer. And then they would proceed to the director and the other stars. Writers would get thanked a lot by best actors and best yeah. actresses, and you know, and for good reason. Uh, I think we had a chat, John, before we went on camera, and you mentioned something of the fact that uh, they better thank the writer. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, one of the interesting things I found was with the rise of independent cinema. Um, I think the the independent producers who were out there, a lot of them actors who wanted to um, have more control of what they did. I think what they did is they started, and what was independent cinema really was the 60s, uh, 60s, 70s. They they always looked for a good script first because they had to raise money. That's right. And That's true. Kirk Douglas uh, as a producer. Um, you know, he was a really uh, prolific independent producer. Right. And uh, and he always found a good script first. He would sell the project with his name, the big name, Kirk Douglas, but with a great script. Right. Uh, so I think writers have always been appreciated. They're just, they, I don't think they get the public rec recognition. Well, there's two movies that I want to mention where, where the script becomes really essential for, for, for various reasons. Not because they're good, but just for various reasons. One is the producers, you know, where uh, where uh, uh, Bialystok and Bloom, <laughs> the characters, are looking for the worst script ever written. Love that <laughs> film. Yes, and you realize why it's the worst script. The other is Argo, which won the Best Picture of the Year, and of course it it deals with a script that's supposed to be a phony. It's a setup. And, and everything revolves around the script. If the script doesn't work, these hostages in Iran don't get out and they die. So yes. scripts, I mean, tributes to scripts like that, that's kind of cool if you think about it. But I would be remiss if I didn't mention one of the great writers of all time. And the reason why he's not considered a writer is because he might be one of the two or three greatest directors ever. And that's the really iconic Billy Wilder. Billy wow. Wilder started his career not as a director. He evolved into being a fine Oscar-winning director. But he was, in fact, a writer, and he just got so tired of directors taking his scripts and uh, doing weird things with them that he decided he was going to direct his own scripts. So, I mean, if you think about it, he worked with Raymond Chandler on Double Indemnity. I mean, think about how wonderful that would have been. <laughs> yeah. Gosh, yeah. that's one of the all-time great scripts, and and it was Billy Wilder and Raymond Chandler. So you know, I think I think we wouldn't be complete in this conversation without another couple of hours. But certainly in the segment that we're doing today, without discussing probably one of the most iconic periods of time and a personality, Trumbo. 
Uh, oh, Dalton oh, Trumbo. Dalton yeah. Trumbo, and uh, you know, I am Trumbo. It wasn't exactly in the script that way, but uh, and maybe Funny. you can elaborate uh, on uh, uh, Trumbo you and know, that whole period of time. I th there's one way to look at this. It was very hard to destroy acting careers. Some were. Gail Sondergaard's a great example. So is Larry Parks. But it was very easy for Congress and the House on American Activities Committee to go after screenwriters because it was those words written on paper that could spark revolutions, and so they thought in, in the government. Yeah. But the truth be told, uh, these were very, very um, great writers of, of really independent thinking that was turned and twisted into what they considered communist propaganda, and Dalton Trumbull and others the, what they called the Hollywood Ten, which were ten screenwriters that um, eventually um, had to work under pseudonyms or not work at all during that entire McCarthy era of the Red Scare. So, yeah. yes, there was uh, many of them. I think John Farrow is another director uh, slash writer that comes to mind, the, the creator of the movie The Five Came Back from 1939, which is one of the first uh, disaster films that featured Lucille Ball, by the way. And uh, so there were many directors and mostly screenwriters that fell by the wayside because of this, uh, of this communist uh, witch hunt that went on in the late 40s and then into the early 50s. Yeah, well, I think that the, uh, the movie uh, uh, about Trumbo and uh, the uh, uh, Kirk Douglas and uh, uh, wanting to use him and just figuring out a way to do it and and, and it was, finally putting it all, I think it was Kirk Douglas said hi. It was him, Kirk right? Douglas, and, and then also at the same time, mm -hmm. and, and literally weeks apart, Otto Preminger for his movie Exodus. So Spartacus and Exodus were the first time Dalton Trumbo was able to then uh, uh, get his name back on the screen credits. And then right before he died, and then right after he died, he was able to pick up his and be recognized for the two Oscars for his writings of Roman Holiday and The Brave One. So, yeah, I, it, it, that's a really tragic and sad tale. But, you know, I don't, I don't know that Dalton Trumbo cared about the awards. He was just wanting to write. That's what he did. That's, that was his livelihood. He would, as, as you remember in the, in the movie, he would, he would do this. He would write his best work from the tub. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, that, that was a great, that was a great movie. Uh, yeah. uh, interesting look at Hollywood, interesting look at history, uh, and an interesting look at writers. So, uh, writers, I, I, you know when the Academy Awards come around this year, I'm going to pay more attention to the writing category. The original screenplay and the adapted screenplay. Yes. There's been two different categories, so yes. Yeah. And can yeah. you, uh, and you actually wrote a, 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 an article on this. Is that available? Yes, on uh, Palos Verdes Pulse. Uh, that's an online a magazine uh, for Southern California, and I believe it's in the May month of, of articles. And I'm pleased to say that some of the uh, co-contributors are friends of mine in the business. Uh, uh, Carrie Bible, who happens to be the uh, one of the directors of what goes on at the Hollywood Forever Museum, uh, Hollywood Forever Cemetery, and one of the, really one of the best writers in Southern California. I'm happy to say Mary Mallory who writes about the architecture of Hollywood. These are uh, also contributors of the, the Palace Verdes Pulse. So that's a great uh, magazine to see uh, and, and, and read uh, wonderful items that uh, make Southern California so, so beautiful and so uh, wonderful to live. And there's also another great place to visit uh, your website. <laughs> ForgottenHollywood.com. Yeah. Yes. Where I get yes. to write. <laughs> and we, I love your blogs read them all the time so that's great so writers hollywood manny pacheco i guess we've covered it all yes everything to do with scribes you bet <laughs> <laughs> so until next time we thank you for joining us thank you manny and uh, we look forward to seeing you again soon for more on celebrating act two visit our webpage. follow us on facebook subscribe to us on youtube and tell your friends, Celebrating Act 2 is the user manual for the second half of your life.